I've had many people tell me that they just had a wonderful encounter with the Lord. They got born again. Their whole life changed. They had joy. They had peace. They were excited. And then they went to church and found out all of the things that they had to do to please God, and they just got burdened down with it. Today, I'm going to share some things with you that will help you. So stay tuned for the gospel truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry emphasizing God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Monday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today, I am continuing and drawing to a close on the teaching that we've been doing for the last five weeks entitled, God's Kind of Love to You. I've actually made a package deal here. I've had an album for many years that I've entitled God's Kind of Love, The Cure for What Ails You. And then what I've been teaching on for the last five weeks is about God's kind of love to you, how God's love for you is unconditional, and we've just been taking a lot of different things and talking about how God loves you. And then during our family Bible conference this last summer, I taught nine lessons on God's kind of love through you, talking about how to walk in love with other people. So we've now got this album that we're te we've been teaching on here for the last five weeks, God's Kind of Love to You. We've got the teaching that I did during the Family Bible Conference on God's Kind of Love through you. We've got the teaching that I've had for a number of years now entitled God's Kind of Love, The Cure for What Ails You. And we've added to this my book on... Uh, Spirit, Soul, and Body, and also my book on uh, the true nature of God. We've put this together and made a, a five-pack that we've uh, been offering on this. And this coming Friday is going to be the end of all of these offers. And so I encourage you to please go to the effort to request these. I think that this is going to make a huge difference. You know, I've said this before, but I taught this teaching on God's kind of love to you at our Winston-Salem Gospel Truth Seminar and I had a woman come up to me who had heard me teach for at least 15 years, maybe 20 years. And she came up after this teaching and said, you know what, I finally got it. After all of the things that she had heard me say, she said this teaching is what really opened her up and helped her to understand how that God loved her unconditionally. And so that's what we've been talking about. I hadn't got time to go back and summarize all of the things that we've been saying but I do believe that this teaching on God's kind of love to you is something that could be a real breakthrough in your life and help you to start understanding and receiving God's kind of love for you in a way that you never have before. So please take advantage of these materials. Now, today I want to go over to Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> the series that we begin a week from today on our Gospel Truth Seminar I mean, our Gospel Truth uh, program is going to be talking about the book of Romans. It's going to be dealing with the grace of God and, and going through the book of Romans. And I want to turn over to Romans chapter 5 and take just a little excerpt here. As we go through our teaching on Romans, I'm not really going to have time to make this point. And so what I'm going to be teaching the rest of this week is also found in a teaching that I've entitled The True Nature of God. And we're offering that separate book that will cover this. But it's going to be right here in Romans chapter 5. When we go through the book of Romans and study it verse by verse, I am not going to have time enough to really emphasize these points the way I'm going to do this week. So actually, all of this is going to fit together in a seamless way, and I think that it's really going to be a blessing to you. But in Romans chapter 5, uh, the first four chapters of the book of Romans, Paul had been making this point about God's kind of love being unconditional, not based on performance, which was a major mindset for the Jewish mind because basically the Jews had related to God based on their keeping of the law, their performance, and how well they performed and kept all of these laws and rituals. And here was the Apostle Paul saying that it's not based on your performance. And he even used Abraham and David is examples of how that God loved them independent of their performance, not because of what they had done, but because of their faith. And then he says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the only way that you can ever have peace with God is if you base your relationship with God on faith, trust, and reliance upon Him. If you base it on your own performance, you are never 
going to have confidence and boldness in your relationship with God. Because even though you might do better than I do or better than some other people do, you are eventually going to blow it. All of us sin and come short of the glory of God. And your relationship with God will be up and down like a yo-yo unless you base your relationship with God on what Jesus did for you and just your trust and faith in what he did. And so that's what that's talking about. In verse 2 it says, By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This says that we have access. The word access here, if you go back into the Greek, it literally is talking about admission. Just like if you go to a movie theater, you have to go through a booth or something and you have to buy a ticket, and that's your admission to be able to get in and see the movie. Well, what is it that grants us admission into this grace of God that provides everything for us? The thing that grants us this access is faith, is what this is saying. Boy, these are some great truths. And again, next week I'm going to begin this series going through the book of Romans, and I'm going to expound on this in a lot more detail. But he just continues to make this point. Let's drop down to verse 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, he says, But God commended his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, you'll often hear this verse just taken out of context, and they will be making the point that God loves sinners. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter how ungodly you've been. God loves you independent of your performance. And that's what that verse is used uh, to make that point. And that is a valid point, and that's a true point, and that is a truth that is being made right here. <clears throat> but the context of this shows that the point really isn't verse 8. The point that he's trying to get to is verse 9. So let's read it in context. In verse 8 it says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. See, the point that he's trying to get to is, he's making a comparison. And he's saying, if you accept that God loved you while you were yet a sinner, which basically most people, most religious people will extend grace and mercy and forgiveness towards a sinner. But then, once a person accepts the Lord, then they start saying, now that you are a child of God, you've got to do this and this and this and this and this. You know, if a person came to your church, and if they hadn't been reading their Bible every single day, if they hadn't been paying their tithes, if they hadn't come to church as much as they should, if they were lost, if they had never made a commitment to the Lord, you would extend grace and mercy towards them because, after all, they're a lost man. And we take this principle, God commends his love towards sinners, and he died for them. And so we would extend mercy towards somebody who wasn't studying the word and praying and going to church and paying their tithes and living holy and doing all of these things. But let that person come and make a commitment of their life to the Lord, get born again, and then if they miss a Sunday, if they don't pay their tithes, if they don't study the word, if they don't pray the way that they should, the very people who would have extended mercy towards them as a sinner will now turn around and if they're born again say, you better start doing what's right if you ever want God to bless you. God won't answer your prayers. God's not going to heal you. This is the reason things aren't working in your life is because you aren't doing this, this, and this. See, that's inconsistent. The Bible says over in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. That means that if you accepted that God loved you while you were yet a sinner so much that he died for you, well, then much more now you should be able to accept the love of God. If God was gracious to you before you got born again, he is even more gracious to you now that you are born again. Well, that is a wonderful truth. And see, what he's doing in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, is using that truth that God commended his love toward us in while we were yet sinners. He's using that as a stepping stone to reach an even higher truth. That is, that if God loved us while we were yet sinners so much that he died for us, then much more now that you've been born again does God love you. Most Christians believe it's much less, much less. I've actually heard a sermon one time where a person 
uh, use this illustration in saying that, you know, you don't correct your neighbor's kids. You don't go over and spank them. You spank your own kids. And that yet God is tough on his own kids. And he will correct you. And God will hit you with this and judge you with this. But the unbelievers out here, those aren't his kids. So he treats them differently. That's just the opposite of what this is saying. This is saying that if God's love was so great towards you, it, that be while you were a sinner, before you ever made any commitment, before you ever started going to church, paying your tithes, even trying to live good, he loved you so much that he died for you, then much more now he loves you. He is much more gracious to you now. This is a radical truth, and it's a truth that basically religion has totally ignored and accepted. And like I said, you know, there's a lot of people that I meet that they may say this in different ways, but here's basically what they're saying is that they made a commitment of their life to the Lord. They fell in love with the Lord. They knew that God loved them. Their life just took on a dynamic that it had never had before. Their life was wonderful. And then they went to church. And in church, they started being told all of the things that they had to do and, and told that unless you do this, God won't do this. And they started putting conditions on God's love. And they said that, you know, they just lost their zeal. They lost that joy because of all of the rules and the regulations that church placed on them. Now, again, I've said this many, many times, but it needs to be said again. I am not against church. I believe that the church is the body of Christ, but I believe that there are good and bad churches, and there are a lot of churches today that are taking the joy and the love out of people's relationships with God because of their legalism and their rules and their regulations. This is not what the gospel is preaching. Is God calling you to Karis Bible College? When Jimmy first mentioned coming to CBC, I told him he was out of his mind. I haven't always been a very obedient child. I said, Lord, you know, I just can't imagine myself doing anything else. And I said, well, I'd like to expand my vision. My spirit said, uh, you need what he's got. I remember when I filled out the application that I had, I just had such a strong passion that I said, man, I'm ready to move tomorrow. I am coming to school, absolutely. I just know I'm here because the Lord called me here. It took me a long time, but I finally came around that way. You've got to imagine yourself doing something else. Go to our website at www.awme.net and click on the Bible College link or call our helpline at 01922-473-300. We hope to hear from you today. And now, Gospel Truth continues. So I was saying from Romans chapter 5 that if God loved us before we got born again to the degree that he would lay down his life and die for us, then much more now that we've accepted him as our Savior can we expect the love and the grace of God to flow towards us. And that's what Romans 5, 8 and 9 is saying. <clears throat> it's summed up in verse 10. It puts these two thoughts together in one verse, and it says, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled unto God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And this is the whole point that he's making right here. He's talking about God's kind of love to us, that it's unconditional and that it's abundant and that it's full. And yet most people honestly do not see God loving them this way. They really see God as this harsh taskmaster that is waiting in heaven for you to just get out of line and waiting to judge you. And let me make some statements here that are going to seem kind of strange to some of you. But do you know where people get a lot of these ideas from about God being so harsh? They actually get them from the Bible. They actually get them from the Old Testament scriptures, specifically like Moses, where a man who went out and violated the, the first person who broke one of the Ten Commandments about, and he picked up sticks on the Sabbath day so that he could make a fire uh, they knew that he had broken the commandment that was given and they didn't know what to do, so they put him uh, in, in jail, basically held him until they could hear from God and an audible voice from God came and said, stone the man to death, make an example out of him, give him no mercy. And so a man was put to death for gathering sticks to make a fire and that was considered work on the Sabbath day. 
And then you could just go through and show so many Old Testament examples where the wrath of God was released and plagues went out and destroyed people and things happened. And because of this, it has given people an impression of the wrath of God, of God being this taskmaster who, yes, there is love, but it's only available to those who meet all of the conditions. And only if you do everything perfectly, then can you expect God to love you. But if you fall short, instead of the blessing comes the curse. And that's the way that most people relate to God. And a lot of that comes from Scripture. But it is a misunderstanding of Scripture because in the New Testament there has been a change in God's dealings with mankind. God himself hasn't changed, but God has changed in the way that he deals with mankind. And the reason is because of Jesus. When Jesus came, Jesus satisfied all of the righteous justice demands of God for payment on sin. Jesus literally took our sin into his own body on the tree and suffered for us and satisfied the wrath and the punishment of God to such a degree that now God is able to extend love towards us in ways that could never have been done prior to that. Plus, not only did Jesus pay a price, but now through Jesus we can be born again. And these are some of the concepts, see, that are presented in the New Testament that were not presented in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, no one was born again. They, they didn't get changed at their very core level. Their nature wasn't changed. And so they were by nature a child of the devil. The New Testament person, you and me, after Jesus has made his atonement, if we make Jesus our personal Lord, you become changed not only in just your mind in an opinion. It's not just you embracing the fact that Jesus was the Son of God, but when you do that and make a true commitment of your life to the Lord, then you get changed at your heart level. In this innermost part of you, you become a brand new person that never existed before. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says that. If any man's in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. So you get changed at your very core level, and you become the righteousness of God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24 says, Put on this new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And since God is a spirit, John 4, 24 says God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God can now deal with you and me totally differently than he ever dealt with even the very holiest, best Old Testament saint. And the reason being, an Old Testament saint wasn't changed at their nature. They may have made a commitment to the Lord, they may have released faith, and they might have been seeking after the Lord, and so God granted them relationship and extended a certain degree of mercy towards them, but they were still by nature a child of the devil under the old covenant. In the new covenant, you aren't by nature a child of the devil. You get your entire nature changed. You become a brand new person. God is a spirit and he sees you and deals with you based on who you are in the spirit. That's what we spent all last week dealing with. And because of those things, because this has happened, now the love and the mercy and the grace of God is extended towards us in ways that just are totally, totally contrary to everything that took place in the Old Testament. And so what I'm going to be doing this week is establishing and just showing you some things about how that Jesus forever changed the way that God deals with mankind. There is a huge difference between the way God dealt with people under the old covenant and the way that God deals with people under the new covenant. And it's, and it's because of these covenants. The old covenant was based on our performance. And prior to us putting faith in a Savior and receiving His righteousness as a gift, when we were just having to approach God on self-righteousness, it was on shaky ground. And I guarantee you there was no confidence, there was no boldness. And even if you did good this week or the next week or two weeks, three weeks, whatever, you were eventually going to fail and the wrath and the punishment of God was going to come upon you. But in the New Testament, it's totally different. 
because now our righteousness, our right standing with God is based on what Jesus did for us and the only thing God demands on us is for us to believe, to accept it by faith, to trust in the Lord Jesus. And when you do that, you move into a realm that the Old Testament saints never even thought of. So there is a huge difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. A lot of Christians only believe that the only difference between the Old and the New Covenant is just one blank page in your Bible. They don't really understand this. But we're going to be going through some things right here in this fifth chapter of the book of Romans. We'll show you some of the major differences in the way that God deals with people. Let me just kind of boil all of this down and make a couple of statements and then I'll spend some time explaining this. But if you have made Jesus Christ your personal Lord, if you know that you know that you know that you're born again and that you aren't going to go to hell and that you have a relationship with God, and yet if you aren't experiencing the love of God, instead you feel like God is displeased with you, you feel like you've messed up, you've blown it, that how could God ever be pleased with you? You aren't pleased with yourself. If that's where you are, then whether you realize it or not, you have not understood the new covenant. You are still relating to God on the basis of your performance. You are still taking the Old Testament precepts and mindset and trying to relate to God basically the way that Moses or Abraham or David would have. And yet all of those people, every person that I mentioned, prophesied that there was coming a better day. Moses talked about that there would be, matter of fact, he's quoted over in Romans chapter 10. When we get into this series on Romans that we start with next week, we'll be using that. And, and uh, Moses prophesied in Romans chapter 10, and he says, what do we have to do? Do we have to ascend into heaven? That is, and in the New Testament, in Romans chapter 10, it says that would be like bringing Christ down from above. Or do we have to descend into the deep? Then that would bring up Christ again from the dead. In other words, he was quoting from Moses, but he was giving the New Testament application. Moses longed and saw by faith the day, the covenant that you and I have been offered by God, and he longed for it. David prophesied about this a number of different times. And over in Romans chapter 4, I'm not going to take time because we're going to cover this starting on our teachings next week. But in Romans chapter 4, it's quoted uh, David from uh, Psalms 32, and it says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Not only did not, does not, but future tense, will not. David was a prophet, and he saw that there was coming a better covenant, and David longed for this. And you know, over in the book of Peter, Peter wrote about this, <clears throat> and Peter said that all of the Old Testament saints longed for this day that you and I live in, and they looked diligently and desired to have what you and I have. And yet most New Testament Christians today don't even recognize the difference between the covenant we're living under and the covenant that Moses and David and all of these people lived under in the Old Testament, and they are trying to relate to God exactly the same. I hear people, I go into these churches and I hear people singing some of David's songs like, Restore unto me the joy of my salvation and take not your Holy Spirit from me. And they sing that. And they think that this is wonderful. It's from Scripture. But you know what? David didn't have the promise that God would never leave him nor forsake him, that regardless of what he did, he'd be merciful to his unrighteousness. No, David had to maintain his relationship with God. And David lived under a worse covenant than what we do. And so it was appropriate for David to pray those things in Psalms chapter 51. But it's wrong for a New Testament believer to say, Oh God, don't leave us. Oh God, stay with us. Go with us throughout this week. Come and be with us. All of these things are indications that you do not understand this new covenant that God has given us. And so this week, this is what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be going through, and we're going to continue in Romans chapter 5 here, and we're going to talk about this new covenant and how it has released the love of God to us. And I tell you, it's going to make a huge difference in your life. Also remember that this is our last week to be dealing with this teaching on God's kind of love to you. So it'll be our last time this week to offer the entire album and to offer you this individual teaching entitled God's True Nature. And so I think that these teachings would really, really help you. Please listen as our announcer gives you some information. 
Please call or write and receive these materials and then join me again tomorrow as we continue the gospel truth. Andrew's five-part teaching titled, God's Kind of Love to You, is available on CD for a gift of 16 pounds or more. Or you can receive the album as part of the God's Kind of Love five-pack for a gift of 60 pounds or more. The five-pack includes God's Kind of Love to You, God's Kind of Love Through You, and God's Kind of Love, The Cure for What Ails You. The companion teachings, The True Nature of God, and Spirit, Soul, and Body are included, and you can choose them on book or CD. Request God's Kind of Love 5-Pack when you write, call, or go to our website. Be sure to specify the companion teachings in book or CD. The fifth individual CD in the God's Kind of Love to You album is available for a donation of three pounds. But to those unable to send a gift, Andrew and his partners will provide this fifth CD free of charge. Our address is AWME, that's Andrew Womack Ministries of Europe, P.O. Box 4392, Walsall, WS1, 9AR, England. Our telephone number is 01922 473-300. Or you can go to our website at any hour. You can use credit card to make donations and receive ministry products 24 hours a day at www.awme.net. Thank you for your gift today. I'm sure that many of you have recognized there's a lot more to understanding God and understanding the Word than probably what meets the eye, that there's, it's more involved. And you know, this is the reason that I'm on television teaching these things. The understanding of God's Word is the most important thing that will ever happen in your life. And probably the best way I have to help ground you in the Word of God is our Karis Bible Colleges. Of course, we have our main campus here in Colorado Springs. We have around 300 people that are students here. But then we have over 300 people that are taking it by correspondence. We have four different... Uh, campuses scattered throughout the United States and four outside of the United States. So please call or write, take advantage of the material that is on your screen. We also would like to point out Andrew's upcoming speaking schedule. All meetings are open to the public and no registration is required for these events. I'm coming to Europe for a series of meetings this October in the first part of November. First of all, I'm gonna be in Marseille, France on the 26th and 27th of October and then that evening October the 27th I'm going to be in Nice France I'll also be there the next day and then we're going to the Czech Republic that's the 30th and the 31st of October on November the 1st through the 4th I'm going to be doing a conference in Germany and I'm really excited a lot of leaders are coming to that conference and then we're going to wind up with a ministers conference in England on the 5th through the 7th of November if at all possible, I'd encourage you to join me. God is going to be touching lives and good things will happen. Tune in tomorrow for more gospel truth. God drove them out of the garden so that they wouldn't take of this tree of life, eat it, and live forever under this terrible guilt and condemnation and corruption that had entered the world. God had a better plan. And so it was actually an act of love to drive them away from this and allow them the opportunity to die physically and to exit this life and to enter into a better life that God had prepared. So most people see God driving Adam and Eve out of the garden as an act of judgment, punishment, wrath, rejection. I believe it's just the opposite. That's tomorrow on Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack.